We're looking in Hebrews chapter 10, and we've been reading from 11 to 25. And obviously this is all about Jesus Christ. And let's just remember what it's been saying. Verse 11. So this is chapter 10, verse 11, Hebrews. It says, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, this is Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. And remember there's a prophecy that uh, Jesus talks about that came from David, you know, that about my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. You know, so this is a prophetic word, it's, it's bringing that prophetic message back in there. And he sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God right now. And from that time, from when he ascended into heaven, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. So obviously, time is moving on and his enemies, that's Satan and his hosts, and all those that reject him, all those that come against him, all antichrist factions in this world, anything that is anti-God, anti-Christ, these are God's enemies, these are Christ's enemies. And he's waiting until the time when these have come under subjection. And what's happening in the final days of this earth, things are changing. And if you've noticed in the news, and obviously there's been things changing right the way through my life, but there are major things going on now that I have never seen. There are major things happening now that are incredible. The amount of corruption in this world has gone to extremes and there are people trying to run this world and doing everything to just fulfill their own coffers and just you know to make them great and this is happening right right around the world and and things have been going wrong the earth is suffering birth pains all the earthquakes the famines the tsunamis the hurricanes you know, the tornadoes the the weather systems changing floods flood damage people dying, landslips, landslides, you name it, there's so many things, and all the wars, and all the things, I mean, where is there anywhere in the world there isn't really much of a war, especially around the Middle East, especially right across the land, and we've got Russia, we've got China, we've got North Korea, we've got Iran, and we've got, you know, Turkey, and different, different people are coming against the West, and the USA, UK, and other nations, it's, it's, you know, it's waiting to burst all the time. And we've all s already had all this going on for many years. But it's starting to wind up. It's starting to really come to a head. And this is where it's coming from. And, you know, Christ's enemies are going to made a f to be a footstool. So anything that's setting itself up against God, against the Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns, you know, we know that that is the time when things have changed. But we're going to have to go through some stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. You know, we're now having our human rights taken away by expecting people to be vaccinated. You know, to be vaccinated. We, we know where in my lifetime have I had this happen. This is the sort of thing that happens, that happened under the Nazis. That people were, you know, made to do things. And, and, and things are going really, really badly. This is not a good place, it's not a good time. And I've been preaching for some time saying, look, you're in a good place right now, but things are going to get worse. And people probably thought, oh, he's just doom and gloom, this guy. But seriously, it's all prophesied, it's all in the book, it's all there for you to read. It's all there to understand that, you know, we don't know the, the day and the time when Christ is going to return. We don't know exactly when this world is going to come to an end, but we do know we're in the last days. We do know we're in the last period. This is happening. And we had the signs in scriptures that talked about Israel becoming a nation and all the Jewish people coming back from all the different parts of the world, which has been happening for years now. Since 48, all the Jews have been coming back in droves from different parts of the world, become a great nation. And this has been happening, you know, for some time. Uh, but things are playing out. Things are going 
the way that the Bible tells us that they're going. So we, we mustn't be fearful or frightened of that because we are going to be okay. We are going to be saved. We are going to be all right. We are going to be fine. So, you, you know, when you start hearing about the latest pandemic coming out, don't swallow it. Don't accept it. We have to stand up against it because it's all big, big, big money. Unfortunately, I have to say that. I have to warn someone somewhere. And, you know, there are so many people out there that are putting their jobs on the line. Surgeons and scientists and professors and doctors, hospital workers. There are many people out there that are having to whistleblow and they're getting either put on leave. They're not getting sacked because obviously then they could ca have a redress and they could get a load of money. So they're putting them on leave. They're not firing them. They're just putting them on a leave. And in Australia, for example, they've put loads, over a thousand people in one particular place, they've put on leave, permanent leave, because they won't take part in the vaccination. And this is happening around the world. We've got doctor friends in Italy and Colombia and other places around the world. And we're seeing all these protests. Everything's going on. The news isn't reporting it. They don't want to report it because the news, all the news uh, stations and even routers and people like that are all owned by the same people that, you know, have shares in the vaccines and everything else. So we've got to be really understanding that this is how the world is going. It's going in a, it's going, you know, in a place where, you know, we may not want to see it go, but it's got to happen. And we've got to be mature about it. We've got to see that this is running down. And so we may have many years left yet, but we are in that last time and we are going to find that there are going to be more and more troubles coming along. We are going to come in under a, a great deal of corruption and persecution and you know Biden apparently was trying to um, stop the religious uh, aspect um, by bringing in laws that, did, that took away the religious freedom and so th this, is, this has been going, it happened in UK I, I, I was one of the ones who went down and protested outside the, the, the Houses of Parliament when they had a, um, a law that they were putting in force which was going to take away our freedom of speech and you know I went down there and protested the, uh, the only time in my life ever that I've ever protested because it's so important because it's also about our religious freedom we've got to be able to speak what we see and what we know and what we understand I'm not talking about hate speech that's different but we've got to stand up and say this is what the Bible says and this is what I believe and you know I don't want to follow in with what the world is is, is pushing me towards I want to continue with God and I think this is really important we have to sometimes stand up and say no that's it you know you're not going to put something in my arm that I don't want thank you very much it's my human rights this is what's going on here Christ is going to come back and all this is going on so Christ is going to return and things are going to change massively and these people that are causing all these problems these are Christ's enemies Anyone, anyone that's coming against his people, and we are his people, are his enemies. We have to understand that. And it's God's enemies. We don't have to be violent. We don't have to be um, aggressive towards others. What we need to do is stand up and say, this is where I stand. And knowing that we have angels at our disposal that are fighting for us, we have a weapon of warfare which is called faith. We have a shield of faith and we have the word of God which is a double-edged sword so we have the weapons of warfare which are peaceable weapons they're not violent weapons we don't need to be violent what we need to do is stand up for what God tells us and then believe like Daniel that God would um, stand with him and that's important it says in verse 15 sorry for verse 14 for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So that's you and I. So God, in one sacrifice, his own sacrifice, sacrifice allowing himself to be sacrificed on the cross and his blood shed, that one sacrifice ha has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's us. It says in verse 15, But the Holy Spirit has also witnessed to us for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. So he's, he's going to put these laws in our hearts. He's not going to make us 
outwardly conforming to rules and regulations. He's going to put this law, the essence of the law, is love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the essence of the law. That's the love aspect of the law. That's the main force of the law. Not the letter of the law, but the spirit behind the law. And the law of love is what God has given us. Loving God, loving your neighbor as you love yourself. These are the two commandments, as we read earlier in the service. This is what Christ told us how to interpret the law. And that's how he does it with, our, with believers. He writes it on your heart. He puts the love of God in your heart. And that's the laws he's talking about. It's the law of love. Okay? This is what he wants us to, to understand. My laws into their hearts. And in their minds I will write them. So we will know, if we're reading God's word, we will know the right way to love others. We'll know the right way to love God. So it's going to be written in our minds. You know, the more we understand what God says to us, the more we're going to understand how to apply these laws to our lives. How we're going to be as people. Are we going to be loving people or are we going to be hostile, aggressive, violent people? Well, you know, some religions advocate violence towards anyone who comes against them. That's not Christianity. And so therefore we need to understand that God calls us to a law of love. And he writes it on your heart. So when you're called by God, which we were talking about earlier, when you're called by God, this is the call on your life. It's the call of love. It changes you from the inside out. It doesn't change you from the outside in with rules and regulations because they're very temporary. And if our heart's not right and we've got rules and regulations, we're not going to keep them very well. But when he changes your heart and you understand the laws are based in love and that you're just following God's love to mankind, to one another, to yourself, and when you can learn that God really loves you, it can change your life can completely change your life, it can turn you around. Because many people don't feel loved. In fact, some people hate themselves. We find this in therapy all the time. People often, their self-worth, their self-belief is so low that they actually hate themselves. And that's not of God. That's of this world. And so we know that when God really shows his love to us, when we really know that we're loved, then we can be feeling we can we can know that love and we can love ourselves so when we're loved we can love ourselves and then we can be loving towards others it's difficult to be loving towards others if you don't love yourself and you can't really love yourself until you really understand the love of the creator the love of god coming to you and sending you his only son to die for you that's how important that love is and the love that Christ showed by willingly dying on the cross for you, that's amazing love. And when you realize that and you realize he did that just for you, it breaks your heart. It brings you to a different place. And therefore your heart changes. And you feel the debt that you owe to God in love. Not in money or not in having to do stuff. I don't think, oh, I have to do this or I have to do that. It's a privilege, because when I've been bathed in God's love, I only want to love God back. And that grace in my life helps me to love other people, because I've been changed inside, not outside. I'm not outwardly conformed, I'm inwardly transformed. And that's what we do. When we're saved, when God really touches us and shows us how much he loves us, it melts us. It can break us. And then we're remade in God's image, in Christ's image. And we get the mind of Christ because we only want to please God by pleasing Christ and being a follower of Christ and standing up for what God calls us to be. And that's what Jesus did for us. It's the covenant, he said, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into... So it's a new covenant. So we had the covenant of Moses. This is a new covenant. This is a covenant of love. This is not the covenant of the law that Moses was delivered you know, Jesus said, Moses said this, but I say to you something else. So, this is what Moses said in the Ten Commandments, but I say this. We can sum those up in two when we get the key of love and we understand God's love coming through those commandments. And then it's easy for us to do them because our heart is changed. 
if we don't want to follow God and if we don't want to obey the law of God through love, then that's because our heart hasn't been changed. For me to actually follow God and do the things that God's asked me to do in the flesh, forget it. There would always be me, me, me in there somewhere saying, I'm not doing that, <laughs> I can't be bothered, no, no, no. All these shoulds and shouldn'ts, I'm not interested. It, it doesn't work that way. When God touches my heart and changes my heart and loves on me to such a degree that I actually fully understand his love and really appreciate his love and really acknowledge and, and know his love, that we have a relationship now, not about rules and regulations, that I know the love of God in my life, what would I want to swap that for anything else for? So therefore I want to follow God. I want, to, I want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the whole point at the end of the day. Verse 17, then he adds, their sins and their lawless good need deeds I will remember no more. So it comes with a promise. This, this promise is saying that he's going to put the laws into their hearts. It's also, it's another law. This is the new covenant law, the new covenant promise their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So he's giving complete redemption through Christ. He died for past sins, present sins, and any future sins that I may commit by mistake, that I may do something wrong, and I know that I am safe in God's hands. Not that I can just go and do what I want. No, it doesn't mean that. I don't want to sin. I don't want to get it wrong. And when I get it wrong, I am not at peace. I'm grieving the Holy Spirit, so I don't feel good if I do something wrong. No, it's not about license to do things wrong. It's just to know that God loves me. And he, there's nothing I can do to make God love me more. Nothing. I don't have to earn my way to salvation. Christ has already completed it. It is a completed work. It is finished, he said. When he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. That means he's taken all your sins on himself. What an amazing saviour to be able to do that, to take all your sins. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. It's like God has dumped all your sins in the farthest ocean and then put a sign on it saying, no fishing. You don't need to go there again. It's done. It's finished. His blood covers you in everything. But it needs to be that you understand from the heart that he is your saviour and that he has died willingly to take away your sins, to exchange places with you, then your heart is changed and you don't want to be sinning. You want to be following God. You want to serve God. You want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what happens inside. It's no good saying, oh yeah, God forgive me. Oh yeah, he's forgiven me. He's put my sins in the dirt deepest ocean and, and now it doesn't matter what I do because it's going to be all right. No, that's not right. That's not going to work. But when you're really covered, when God really touches your heart, it changes you from the inside. You want to serve God. You want to love God back. I, how can I repay the debt that I've seen that God has paid for me? <coughs> you know, a complete reprobate. And God covered me with his blood. And when God looks at me, he sees Christ now because I'm covered by Christ. If I want to see God, I look to Christ because he's the representation of God and he shows me what God's heart is like by the way he lived and the way he died for me. I know that I have a loving Father in heaven who just wants to extend his arms for me and save me from myself and just love on me. What an amazing God I have. This is where we really need to know God in a relationship, not with rules and regulations. This is the book of instructions to know ourselves. It's a window to look through at God. God shows us his, his character, his attributes are all in here. And he shows us, it's like putting a mirror up to ourselves and showing us how bankrupt we are, how far we have fallen from the God standards that we are being taught in those scriptures that he shows us how to love we don't know what love is we have no clue how this sacrificial love works on a fleshly level but through christ we begin to see we begin to understand just how much love god has for his people verse 19 therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of jesus
So now we can come boldly into God's presence. Before, you would come cringing and shamed because you know you weren't right, you know you're not in a good place, you know you're not really interested in God, you're not really following God, you don't really care about God. In fact, you just want to get on with your life and do your own thing because you like it. You like being like that. You like being your own way. Or you are getting to the point of realising that your life is rubbish outside of God. Nothing makes sense. Nothing in this life makes sense. In fact, in the Song of Som Solomon, he says, everything is meaningless. Ecclesiastes, I believe. Everything is meaningless outside of God. And so therefore, it says, verse 20, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So this is a new way that Christ accomplished. It's a living way. So this is not dying, this is living. And God consecrated this new life. So it's not a living death, it's a living life. You know, when we often think when we, when we think about religion and, and being religious, that, you know, oh, all these shoulds and shouldn'ts and musts and mustn'ts, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do all that stuff. But this isn't about that. This is God giving me a new life, a different life, a complete revelation of what life really is and how wonderful it is in Christ. How amazing, how much peace and joy comes into my life through Christ. It changes me. It changes how I want to live because I have something new. I'm not having a living death. I'm actually living for God and I'm in his program. I'm getting with his plan that he has for my life. And it's a wonderful plan. It's amazing. It's always exciting. It's always interesting. It's always new. It's new every morning. That joy comes. When tears are in the evening, joy comes in the morning. That's important to live that kind of life. And verse 21 says, And having a high priest over the house of God. So, in verse 20 it says, He consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. So in the Old Testament, there is this holy of holies, where there's this massive curtain from top to bottom, and nobody could enter except the high priest one day a year with a rope tied round his foot so that they could pull him out in case he was smitten by God. And Christ became that veil that when he was broken, it was split from top to bottom. So God split this Holy of Holies. That was a symbol in the temple that the curtain was split from top to bottom, signifying the brokenness of God's salvation, that God sent his son and it came from heaven down, not from man up which would be the normal way a veil would be split. If you split a curtain, it's going to split from the bottom. It's not going to split from the top. But the temple, the Holy of Holies, the temple curtain split from the top down. And that pointed us to the fact that Christ's body was broken for us to open the way into the Holy of Holies so that we could come boldly into the, the throne room of God to bring our petitions. And this is amazing and having a high priest over the house of God. So he became that high priest. And his flesh was broken. His veil, the veil was torn that we could enter through his blood. And therefore he becomes our high priest forever over the house of God. That's us. We are the house of God. Not the temple, not the stones, not the church buildings. Us. We are the temple of the living God. Verse 22, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We have to repent of our sins. We have to give God the glory. We've got to come to God and say, I know my life is rubbish. I know that I am in a place that isn't good. I know that there is a lot of horrible stuff in me and I need to bring it to you and give it to you and allow you to cleanse me, allow you to change my heart, take away this evil conscience that I have, take away all the hatred and the re rejection that I have, all, all the, the aggression that's in me, just take it away, just cleanse me and our bodies are washed with pure water, we become stones in the temple of the Holy, Holy Spirit. We become stones in that temple of God. So our bodies are important. 
Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. One thing we do know is that God is faithful. All the, all the prophecies in the Old Testament, over 500 prophecies about Jesus Christ, all fulfilled. He's faithful. We can trust God. God delivers. God brings through what he promises. And it says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Let us consider one another. In other words, think about other people, not just yourself. In other words, get away from your selfishness. When God works in your heart, you become less self-righteous and less selfish. And you start to think about your love for God and your love for other people starts to grow. So we stir up that love and good work. So we want to do good to others. This is what he's saying to us. Verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we're not to be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Not to forsake being part of the church and coming together to worship God. Not forsaking that, which is in the manner of some people but exhorting one another, in other words, encouraging one another, reminding one another, we need to come together to worship God, it's important. No man is an island. We need one another, we need the encouragement. It's not good when we stay at home, it's not good when we don't go to church. And so much more as you see the day approaching. What day? What day is he talking about? What we've been talking about in Daniel. This is the day approaching. In Jesus' time he's saying, look, you know, the more you should be loving one another as the day approaches. The more you should be gracious. The more you should be encouraging one another. Because it's not a good time. And you need to consider each other. You need to think about the, the widows and the orphans. You need to think about the people who are weak and fearful. And help them. Help them to cope. Let's just go to the Gospel reading now in Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. More prophecy here, only this time by Jesus. So Jesus has been to Jerusalem. He's entered Jerusalem to ho Hosannas and all the rest of it. And then he's left Jerusalem. Well, he actually turned over the money, chambers, uh, money changers in the temple. And then he wouldn't let anyone into the temple that was doing any everyday business. You know, with their goods and stuff. He wouldn't let them into the temple. He drove them out and said, this is my father's house. So he, he believed in church. He believed in the fact that they had set apart certain buildings to worship God. He, was, he wasn't against church. Sometimes we think he was against church. He wasn't. You know, he didn't want the people in the temple doing everyday business and you know, money changing and earning money off of people and selling things. It, 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 this is a sacred place when we come to God. And so we need to keep that sacred. We need to understand this was, God's, this was you know, God's view of things and the way Jesus saw things. It says in verse 1, Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. So this is one of his disciples, maybe not actually been and, and seen all the amazing, impressive buildings around in Jerusalem. He's going there to worship. He's there with Jesus. He's, he's looking at all these amazing buildings and going, wow, Jesus, have you seen all these buildings? You know, he's seen all these great stones because we're talking about massive stones that would have been moved to be put there that an ordinary person wouldn't understand. How on earth did they get that, those big stones and, and put them together to make this massive temple? I mean, it would have been quite um, awe-inspiring for, for a farmer or a fisherman to see that kind of thing, you know, in the day. They would have been like, wow, look at the, this is really impressing me. Look at this stuff. A bit like Trump Tower, you know what I mean? It's a bit, you can see, <laughs> you can see that there's, there is a, this kind of human kind of way of being impressed by things of this world. And, and we can all get like that, can't we? We can all, oh, look at this guy's money. Look at what this guy's driving. Look at this guy's mansion. Look at this guy telling us how to make loads of money on Forex. Look at his bright yellow Ferrari. And then we find out that he's scamming everybody. <laughs> he's not doing Forex. He's scamming everyone. And this kind of thing going on all the time. So we get impressed by things of this world really easily. And this is what happened. Even one of Jesus' disciples. He's getting impressed. 
And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he's saying, look, there's going to come a day. You think this is impressive? It's all going to be rubble. And of course it was. The Romans sacked Jerusalem and it was rubble. And they were all thrown down. <laughs> and then it says in verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew, this was his kind of inner circle, Peter, James and John and Andrew's there as well, asked him privately, tell us, when would these things be? So when, when's all this going to happen when all these buildings are going to be collapsed, you know? Maybe he thought, thought it was going to be a, an earthquake. God was going to bring an earthquake or something. Not necessarily realising what the Romans were going to do. And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answered him and began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. So he's now, he's kind of sidestepped it a little bit. He's kind of going on about something slightly different. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying I am he. So he's saying, okay, forget the, the building at the moment, but this is going to be the last days. And, and he's, he's prophesying the fact that he's going to be going back to heaven, and then he's going to return. It's going to be his return. So he's come once to the, the earth, when he goes back, he's going to return. And that he's saying, be careful that nobody deceives you. And this is happening all the time. People are uh, uh, arriving in Jerusalem, arriving in Israel, often and declaring themselves to be the Messiah. It's happening quite often. I mean, these are similar people that think themselves as being a poached egg. But, you know, you've got some strange people out there. But there's also a lot of deception. Satan's behind that. Remember the heavenlies? What's going on up there? There's always this fight going on. There's always this antichrist movement in the earth that's always trying to deceive. Satan's job is to deceive, kill and destroy. That's what he does. That's why we have to be careful of him, that we have to not give him too much credence because he's a beaten em enemy, but we have to respect the fact that he has still got a lot of power on this earth. Only in Christ do we come above his power. Before Christ, we're under his power. That's what you've got to remember. You are under the power of Satan until you come under the blood of Christ. It's that simple. So today I'm binding Satan right now and calling anyone that's not really fully in Christ to come out from Satan's clutches, to give their life completely to Jesus Christ and to actually take Jesus as their saviour and ask God to forgive you, repent of your sins and to ask God to forgive you and give you life in Christ. Amen. Amen. But this is it. Peter, James, John and Andrew are asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign? Well, he says, be careful. Take heed that no one deceives you. Verse 6, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will deceive many. So it's going to deceive some. There are going to be people deceived by this. But when you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. The end isn't yet. When you hear all these rumours of wars, and we've had wars and rumours of wars for many years. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be earthquakes in various places and there will be famines and troubles. Troubles being floods and tsunamis and all the rest of it. These are the beginnings of sorrows. These are the beginnings of the sorrows. So this is showing us that these are, it's all gradually been running down. Over the time we've had the World War I, we've had World War II, we're on the verge of World War Three. You know, it keeps going. It's going down all the time. There's more corruption. There are more birth pangs. The earth is groaning. It's running down. Thing, everything in nature lives to die. That was the curse that was on the earth. It's all going to come to an end at some point. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. We've got to realize that. But the most important thing, it's not about pie in the sky when you die. It's about living for Christ today. It's about allowing Christ to come into your heart and bring you peace in each and any circumstance. One of the things that I found when I came to Christ, when I came to God, was the peace that I got. That I hadn't got peace before that. I didn't feel loved. I didn't even know what love was. I have to be honest. I didn't know what love was, but God showed me what love really is. And then God expanded and showed me even more how mature God's love is and how wonderful God's love is and how it can change lives 
and how much he loved me as, his, as a father, that he really is a father figure, that he really wants to just love on you. He wants to bless you, but he can't while you're in rebellion. So all you have to do is come to God, bow the knee, that means repenting, bow the knee, recognize you've got it wrong, recognize that if you carry on like this, your life is not going to be good. You need to understand that God is in control and all you're doing is fighting against his overall creation. You're fighting against his way of being all the time. You're not following God, you're following yourself. And all the time you're following yourself, it isn't going to end well. And the minute you can get back to following God and recognizing God as your creator, he created you. He's given you life and breath and everything you have comes from him, whether you realize it or not. You may have given you talents, you may be clever, you may be able to work things out and earn money and do stuff and get status and all manner of things. But there's still a big hole in your life. There's still a God-shaped hole here. There's still an emptiness that needs to be filled. God can fill that emptiness, but you have to bow the knee. It's not going to happen any other way. He's a gentleman, he's not going to push you and force you, but he's calling. And if he's calling you now, what you need to do is bow the knee and ask God to really change your heart. It's the only way forward. It's the only way you're going to get real peace and real joy and have this emptiness dealt with and taken away. And we want that emptiness to be filled with love. Love for God. Love for yourself. To really love yourself. To understand how to love yourself in a, in a good, healthy way. And then you can love others. Amen? God bless you. <laughs>